Uh, this lecture is introductory material, and uh, the idea is, is to provide today a uh, nature and scope of financial management. The basic idea is to look over the forest to see basically what we're going to be doing before we step in amongst the trees. The idea is, is to hopefully give you an idea that there's a purpose for uh, the formulas and the things that we're going to be studying in this semester. So we're looking at the nature and scope of financial management. Today's lecture will talk about the theory of finance briefly, talk about what financial management is, looking at the financial function, the tools that we have to use in financial management, and if there's time we'll, we'll, we'll get into the financial characteristics of, uh, of agriculture. In terms of reading, you should read chapter uh, one. Uh, I also have a handout. You won't be graded on it, but it's just something if you, if you want to read it, add internet to the list of useful farm tools. It's on my website. Okay, we're going to start today on the theory of finance, and, and we're going to cover this in five minutes, but there are courses taught in this area. We're not uh, going to, to delve heavily into the theory of finance, but I think it's important that you understand why finance is important and what it is. In finance, we're concerned with how individuals and firms allocate resources through time. And this is facilitated by the existence of, of capital markets. Now, in terms of allocation of resources through time, you're, in, you're right here, right now, you're in the process of that. If you think about it, is getting a degree at A&M cheap? It costs money, right? You are basically taking your resources today that you have, your, your foregone income that you could be making, the tuition, the, the uh, money that the, your room and board, okay, transportation, you're taking all of those resources. Why would you get a degree at A&M? So you're, you're, you're willing to forego or give up or expend resources today for the prospect <coughs> that you're going to get a better job of some sort. Or your professional path is going to be such that whether it's money or whether it's just pride of uh, your profession, <coughs> you're betting that that's going to pay off, provide you resources in the future more so than what you would get if you didn't uh, have the degree. Uh, and obviously, w either, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, all of you have made that decision because the cost is high. Even, even, if, even if you're getting a free ride from your parents or for scholarships or, or athletics, there's still a cost. Why? Okay, you got to study. You have to give up a lot of your time. And that study and work, if you weren't, if you weren't doing that, what could you be doing? You could be working. You could be earning money. And in fact is, some of you already know fellow students in high school that are already making good money and have cars and they've got a house. Well, the difference is, is 30 years from now, you'll see a big difference. In other words, you're foregoing that right now, all of that, you're foregoing leisure and, and uh, money and a house and a better <laughs> car and better clothes for that prospects in the future. And that's what we mean by allocating these resources through time. I'll broaden that to, to a business in a minute. But, but let's talk now about this, this second bullet where it says it's facilitated by the existence of a capital market. Let's impose some assumptions here. Let's say that there were no capital markets. The capital markets that we haven't well defined, but you're looking at the stock market, the bond market, commercial banks where you can save your money, they lend money to other people. You know, that's what we're talking about in the capital markets. Let's assume that those capital markets didn't exist. Now let's also assume that you want a degree at A&M and you're just out of high school and you want to come here. Let's assume that you don't have savings. Let's assume that your parents, for whatever reason, really can't afford the tuition and to, and to send you here. Maybe because they already have four kids in college and you're the fifth and they just can't do it, whatever reason. Let's also assume that uh, your grandparents and your, your rich uncle, or you don't have a rich uncle that will send you there. Let's also assume that you're not a gifted athlete and let's also assume that you're not getting a free ride scholarships and fellowships which is probably most of you here so under that scenario how are you going to finance your education at A&M the loans and grants are very critical but what was my first assumption there's no capital market there is no banks there is no there is no bond market there's nobody to lend you money in a 
organized structure. Okay, one way is, is that you could work for it. Well, you go out at a minimum wage, maybe in a couple of years, you might, you know, scrape up enough money to pay your tuition and, and living on peanut butter and crackers, you can may be able to get here for a semester or two, then you work in the summer. And, but but in, in that process, you're probably also working while you're getting an education, which is gonna slow you down, take away your time to do your homework here in this class. And But that's that, that's one way, and many of you are doing that. How else? There's people out there that have money, and there's people out there that might lend it to you, but who are they? Okay, there's, you, you got a rich neighbor down the way that just sued the uh, XYZ McDonald's for spilling hot coffee, and he's got millions of dollars, well, you go knock on his door, right? Well, he doesn't like you, so he doesn't give it to you. So, well, you try the doctor that does, you know, three or four uh, heart transplants a, a week, and so you go to him and, and see if he'll lend you the money. He may or may not. You knock the doors, right? Is that an easy process? That's why this allocation of resources through time is facilitated by the market, because that's the first thing you said, right? If you need it, let's go borrow it. Well, that's facilitated by the capital markets, and that's exactly right. And I bet many of you here have actually taken out student loans to go to school here, even if you're working. Now, out of interest, before this uh, semester is over, I'm going to actually show you that uh, if you borrow a lot of money to get your education, it's all got to be paid back, and I'm going to show you that that sometimes hurts. This whole process, and, I, and the only reason illustrate this through <coughs> education, human capital basically, you are investing in your human capital is because uh, you understand that very well. But this same process takes place with you have a business. If you want to start a farm, you basically have to invest your resources today to buy your land, the machinery, and your capital. And why do you do that? And, and that also includes the capital markets because frequently you buy part of that. We'll discuss that in just a second. With the prospect of what? Earning money in the future. Hopefully you recognize after discussing this that theory of finance or financial markets, uh, this whole package, is whether you understand it or not, it, it's affecting you. And hopefully you understand it's important that you understand this process. Okay, looking at financial management, it involves the acquisition and uses of financial resources. Back to the example of, of an education. The, you have to acquire the resources by which you can pay your tuition, your books, and your room and board, your transportation to, to get to invest in you and human capital. That's part of it. Also, it's the protection of equity and capital from risk. We can even talk about that in terms of, of an education. Because once you invest your resources into, your, <coughs> into human capital or getting your degree at A&M, you need to protect that investment. You have to protect it in several ways. One, if after investing the tuition and books and having your, and, and, uh, you're locked into paying your room and board for, for the semester, and you decide to go party the whole semester, what's going to happen? If you decide to party the whole semester, what's going to happen to your grade? Likely, you will fail or end up withdrawing. So what happens to your tuition? It's all gone. What happens to that four years of your life that you could have been developing professionally? It's gone. There's incentive once you put the money on the table to make this decision, you have to manage that to protect that investment. It's true of any business. You've got to protect that equity that you have. In financial management, it, it considers concepts, tools, methods of analysis, financial markets, and policy issues. This is an introductory class in finance. This is where you learn the vocabulary. Painful, but you've got to learn the vocabulary. It's introductory, so we'll give you the basics, conceptual framework by which you can view these financial markets or the acquisition of assets and the, the uh, allocation of resources through time. We're going to give you the tools to look at that so you can make good and correct decisions. And that's what we're going to look at, at the tools that you have available, the methods of analysis, <coughs> and on the peripheral we'll look at the financial market and policy issues as those affect the uh, financial decisions. Is this easy? 
No. Is it important? Yes, because you're all going to be part of this. Whether it's driving you or you drive it, it's, you can't ignore it. Or I mean, you can't ignore it, but it's going to be your wealth that is at stake or the wealth of your company. And if you want to be successful in terms of your personal wealth or whether you've got a business that you're structuring, if you don't understand finance, if you come out okay, it's going to be by pure luck. And there's not very many that, that survive by just pure luck. So we're providing you with a basis of tools and conceptual framework by which you can make intelligent financial and investment decisions. But this is an introductory course. You know, the next course is up or through your personal experience, then you can use those in applications that obviously are more interesting than just going through the vocabulary and the, and the conceptual framework. And now let's talk about the financial function or you can think of it as financial activity. And I'm going to ask the question, what do you need if you want to farm or ranch? And I, I want to take just a minute here and also point out that this class is financial management and agriculture. That's our examples many times are related to farm or ranch. But this is just as applicable to an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial business of any kind. Whether if, you're, if you want to be a veterinarian and you want to think about starting a veterinary clinic or be part owner of one, this is just as relevant. If you want to be in real estate and start your brokerage firm, it's relevant or your own insurance company or, or you want to start if you're in animal science if you want to start your own stable of boarding uh, horses a lot of those are agriculture you know any any type of, of entrepreneurial firm this is applicable so when I say farmer ranch if you if you're interested in different business substitute that in your mind so what do you need if you want to start a farm or ranch? Okay, land, assets. The assets that include your assets, which includes your tractor, your land, your machinery, your plows, your fences, all of those things, and in some case even your, your cash for liquidity, all of those are assets. Now, how do you get gain control of those assets? Capital. And where do you get that capital? Your personal wealth, which we refer to as your owner equity or net worth. So you have your owner equity and then you also said bank. So you have your lending capital and equity capital. Well, first of all, you're, you have to put your own personal wealth into it or equity into buying that land. And from that, we get a new word that you probably were exposed to in your accounting classes. It's called leverage. You may not have known where that word came from, but leverage, you're basically taking that little bit of equity that you have and you're going to the bank and saying, look, I'm going to put this much money into the land and equipment. I need to borrow X amount more to have a critical mass of assets. You are leveraging the money, your personal wealth. You are leveraging it so that you can uh, obtain enough assets to have a viable business. That's where the word leverage comes from. And we'll, we do have a couple lectures at the end on that particular concept. Well. Let's suppose that you've obtained enough capital for your equipment and 100 acres of land. You're not going to make a living on 100 acres of land. You need at least 300 acres of land in certain areas. So how are you going to get that extra 200 acres of land? You're strapped out now in your own personal wealth. You've borrowed as much money as you can. You could get partnerships or even incorporate in some cases. A brother, in many cases your father or an uncle. But that still, if they come into the business, they're bringing what? They're not going to lend you that money. They're going to, if they come in as a partner, they are bringing their own personal wealth, right? So they're bringing more equity into the business. You're an A&M graduate and they went to UT and they're not going to give you a dime. So now where do you go? Uh, investors? What kind of? They are investors, but they're specifically, they're what? Somebody that they're going to lease the land, right? So we get that from the lessor. And in fact, in agriculture, uh, much of the land is leased. So those are the broad categories of, of obtaining the capital you need to control the assets. Well, now you have your land and your equipment, and, you know, machinery, your fences, uh, livestock. For what purpose? You want to make money, right? If you're going to put, if you're going to allocate all that resources now, foregone consumption, whatever, for this uh, operation, what you're hoping is is that it's going to return uh, income or profits over time. Now, for that to, to turn a profit, we have to manage those assets. To manage those assets, we can break that management process up into three groups. Production, 
financial, and marketing. Now, I suspect if I ask, most of you have here have had a, man a production or management class. Most of you have had a marketing class. You have two legs of a three-legged stool, right? So you go out into business, do you want to be out there always managing with sitting on two legs? You need that third <coughs> leg, which is the financial part of it. So why are you here in this class? Is basically to get the uh, complete the set of tools that you need to be successful in running a business. And this is the financial part of it. Now, it is true that you can't just look at the financial part of management and ignore the marketing or the production. They all have to be interrelated. They are interrelated. And you have to consider the marketing with the management. You don't make a financial decision without understanding what decisions you've made in the production side or the marketing side. So in the end, after you get classes in the management, production, financial, and the marketing, then you have a capstone course that pulls all those together. In Ag Eco, it's 440, where it's expected that you have an understanding of all of those so that you can manage, so that you can do what? Make a profit. And if you are the CEO of a small company and you consistently don't make a profit, what's gonna happen? You're gonna be gone. If you own your own business and you consistently don't make a profit, what's gonna happen to your net worth? It's going to disappear until you ultimately are foreclosed on or are bankrupt. So hopefully that's motivation in itself to recognize that uh, it is important that you understand the financial part of the business so that you can be successful. And being successful implies that you make a profit. Or if you never, and you say, oh, it doesn't mean a thing to me. I'm going to be a veterinarian. I'm not going to run a business. I'm just going to take care of the animal. Well, you have to manage your own resource. And if you don't manage your own resources, and you're 65 years old, and you no longer want to take care of that sick cow, you don't have the resources. You're dependent on that paycheck month to month, unless you know how to manage these resources. We made a profit. What do we do with it? Somebody has a claim on that profit. And they want it first. The lessor, but, but even before then, the bank. Well, even before government, the bank has a claim on it. So we have to pay the interest to the lender. And then where? The lessor. If we've rented that land, that lessor, probably at the beginning of the cycle, is going to want payment. Now where? After we pay the lender and the lessor, Uncle Sam wants his cut. And uh, through this semester, I'll probably get up on my soapbox and complain about taxes. So just get used to it. I pay way too many taxes, as you will, hopefully, meaning you make lots of money and pay taxes. OK, so Uncle Sam takes his chunk. Now who gets a chunk? The wife, because that's exactly right. It goes for family withdrawing, withdrawals or for living, for expenses, for your trip to uh, Florida. Now, if you're doing a partnership or a corporation, you might refer to that as dividend in your accounting classes that don't refer much to agriculture. They probably didn't call it family withdrawals. They probably call it dividends. That's money that's taken out of the business for personal consumption. Now, wh whatever's left, we can do what? Put it back in the business. And what do we call that in accounting terms? We call it retained earnings. It's money that we retain into the business. And what's interesting, the retained earnings increases our wealth, our equity, our wealth. So if you uh, had a bumper year, and uh, you decide that you're going to take several trips to uh, Florida or Hawaii and buy yourself a personal truck or build a new house for the lady, what does that do to your retained earning? It goes down. Might even go negative, right? What happens to your wealth? It goes down. You know, and that, that's one of the interesting phenomena that you're going to face if you start a business when you're young is that you're going to want to retain as much of those earnings as you can into the business because that increases yeah. your equity and wealth, which then allows you to expand your business, which allows you greater profits, which keeps going and rolling and rolling. But on the other hand, when you're young and you get married and you have kids, what do they want? They want money. And so what does that do to your retained earnings? goes down. Sorry, but you got to face that. You know, and that's where you have to dig in your heels. And I'll have, I'll probably do several examples of that through the course to help you realize that you get your job and you go out there and you buy the new car and you, and you buy the biggest house you can afford and you buy the nicest clothes. What is that going to do to your net worth? It's going to hurt it instead of putting it into investments that have a residual income, that have earning. Another topic for another day. With all of this that we have going on in the business, and we want to go borrow money to somebody else, or you want to brag to your parents or somebody about how well you're doing, how do you show 
all of this statement. Okay, the overall process is called accounting. That's why you took your accounting classes, is so that you could learn how to describe what's going on in a business or understand what's going on in a business. And with that, you usually start with a beginning balance sheet that lists all the assets that you have. And on the other side, to balance it, it shows you how much money you've borrowed and how much net worth you have. And as you recall from the accounting relationship, the debt or the liabilities plus your net worth is equal to your assets. That has to balance. That shows your financial position at the beginning of the production cycle. Then you uh, manage these uh, assets through the production cycle. You have expenses and then you have returns and all of that's accounted for in what's called the income statement that shows your profit. Then those profits are distributed to the uh, lender and what's withdrawn from the business and the lessor and what's retained in the business and uh, through that process you account for all the cash flow coming in and out and then you end up with the ending balance sheet that shows you your change in your financial position, particularly in what's happened to your assets and what's happened to your debt and what's happened to your net worth over that production cycle. And that uh, period of time between the beginning and the ending balance sheet, we look at our financial performance that shows how we have managed our assets, how much money we've made, and what's happened to our uh, liquidity position or our cash flow position. A simple diagram, but that's rich with a lot of meaning in terms of what happens inside a business. <coughs> Obviously, each one of these boxes can be dissected with a heck of a lot more information, uh, but this at least gives you a, a broad view, the forest, of what we look at in, in financial management. The tools of financial management that we have, obviously we have the accounting statements that we've already talked about, the accounting information, and we can use these uh, financial statements also for planning. And we can create a business plan that says, okay, 30% of our production in the past has been in corn and 70% in cotton. Now with the new subsidization of ethanol, corn prices are sky high, you say, okay, I'm going to pr uh, produce 70% uh, in corn and only 30% in cotton this year. And then you can basically ask the question, well, what happens then to the financial position and performance of the firm if we make that change? And you can filter that through the financial statements. And this pro forma statement, that's just a big word for projected, meaning next, projecting out next year. If we follow this business plan and these things occur, this is what's going to happen in our financial statements that shows our financial position and performance. There's lots of budgets that are involved in financial management. The enterprise budget, we're not going to delve into that. If you take the farm management class, then you'll, you'll spend a lot of time with that. But in, briefly, if you were to do an enterprise budget for corn, you'd have the yield of corn times the price of corn, and then you'd list the expenses for the fertilizer, the seed, the fuel, uh, some accounting for depreciation and for the, for the cost of land and labor, etc. And, and then you'd have a per acre net return to corn. The uh, partial budget is like an enterprise budget, but if you wanted just to focus on, for example, a cull cow in your dairy herd, you could basically look at that cow's uh, performance and medical cost versus a uh, replacement heifer and look at their differences and, and just partially uh, pencil out whether uh, it would be good to cull a cow or not cull a cow. And that's ignoring the whole process uh, of the enterprise of a dairy firm or the whole business analysis. Cash flows you're familiar with, and in this class we're going to spend a lot of time developing the capital budget so it's clear as to how to uh, allocate our net worth. Okay, these next set of slides in the financial characteristics of agriculture, <coughs> you can look at those in your book or on the VISTA. Basically, the, the idea on these financial characteristics is that the debt is important. In some cases, uh, interest makes up 10% of your production cost, which means it can't be ignored. The other thing that I like to show is if you look at the demographics of who owns the farm and ranch ran land, they're getting old. There's going to be a lot of retirements here in the next five to 15 years. 
That means lots of opportunities for somebody that wants to get into production agriculture. And in fact, many states and even government programs are being created so people like yourself that wants to get in and start farming, there is some very cheap money out there. That's, that's something I want you to be aware of. Now many of you may want it, nothing to do with production agriculture, but if you do, there's some opportunities that are looming in the future. And the last slide just shows you who the lenders are in agriculture. The farm credit system, which is a bank of cooperatives owned by farmers that lend primarily to agriculture. You have commercial banks, you have life insurance companies, you have single proprietors or into retiring farmers that, that will basically lend the money to somebody starting out, and of course government agencies.